July the 4th, 1943, the fourth year of the Second World War, a plane carrying the Polish Prime Minister in exile, Władysław Sikorski, takes off from Gibraltar and 16 seconds later, plunges into the sea. To this day, mystery surrounds the plane crash. Was it an accident? Was it sabotage? Or political assassination? Sikorsky, an ally of both Stalin and Churchill, but also a threat to their alliance. Did they sacrifice the Polish leader to their own interests? July the 8th, 1943. British troops escort Sikorsky's coffin through the streets of Gibraltar. Honor and respect paid to the commander of the fourth largest Allied army. For every Pole, the death of Sikorsky is a painful event and a historic turning point. From that moment on, Poland's fate took a completely different course. Krakow. Sikorsky was laid to rest in Fawel Castle, alongside Polish kings. But his death still occupies Europe to this day. Uncertainty, contradictions, and conspiracy theories surround the demise of one of the leading politicians of the Second World War. In a bid to shed light on the case, in 2008, the Polish public prosecutor ordered the exhumation of Sikorsky's body. The remains were to be examined in Krakow's Institute of Forensic Medicine. Using state-of-the-art techniques and equipment, they hope to settle once and for all the questions surrounding the circumstances of Sikorsky's death. X-rays revealed 66 fractures and a wooden splinter in the skull. The autopsy showed that Sikorsky had not been strangled, shot, or poisoned. But the reconstruction remained incomplete. Sikorsky. Husband and loving father of a daughter. In the First World War, an officer in the Austrian army. At the same time, he was part of an underground movement fighting for the independence of Poland, which was split up at the time between Austria, Prussia, and Russia. A man of determination and ambition. Sikorsky's ascent to the political and military leadership of his country began in 1939, just four years before his death. In Moscow in the summer of 1939, Foreign Ministers Ribbentrop and Molotov negotiated the German-Soviet non-aggression pact. In a secret protocol, the new allies agreed to divide up Poland between the Nazi Reich and the Soviet Union. Just one week later, on September the 1st, Germany invaded Poland. Against the German military superiority, Poland stood no chance. Great Britain and France declared war on Germany, but did not provide Poland with military aid. Hitler celebrated his swift victory with a huge parade in Warsaw, marking the start of the worst years in Poland's history, a time of suppression and terror. In the middle of September, the Red Army occupied the eastern half of the country, which was now under Stalin's control. The state of Poland was wiped off the map. 
its people were subjected to humiliation, deportation, and extermination. Thousands of Polish soldiers were taken prisoner by the Germans or the Soviets. Most of the Navy and Air Force, in contrast, managed to escape to the West, where they became, under General Sikorsky, the Polish armed forces in exile. Sikorsky flew to Paris, where he had friends and supporters. He spoke good French and had earlier worked for the French Secret Service. He gathered the Polish refugees around him and formed the Polish government in exile, of which he became prime minister. In impassioned speeches, Sikorsky succeeded in uniting the divided factions among the Polish exiles. In 1939, he was seen as the only uh, possible leader of the Polish uh, fighting nation, so to speak. Um, and he came to France very quickly after the uh, fall of Poland in September 1939, facilitated by the French, it should be said. And he was then uh, appointed first prime minister and then commander in chief of the Polish armed forces. And he was seen as the unifying person um, and his government was a coalition government of the four main uh, opposition parties. In 1940, German forces also scored a lightning victory over France. Sikorsky and his exile government, together with parts of the Polish armed forces, escaped again, this time to London. Sikorsky's intelligent and energetic daughter, Zofia, accompanied her father. They had a close relationship. She worked as his secretary, translated for him since he spoke hardly any English, and also supported him on policy decisions. Zofia was uh, General Sikorsky's only daughter, and she was with him from 1939 throughout the whole period, um, along with uh, his wife. Um, she was his only daughter, so there was a very close relationship. Um, and it should be remembered that she was a member of the uh, Polish Army Women's Auxiliary Service. And in that capacity, um, she was going with her father to inspect troops. June the 2nd, 1941. Without warning, Hitler launched an attack on the Soviet Union. Codenamed Barbarossa, the plan was for German forces to advance swiftly eastwards. The Red Army was initially powerless to resist the German onslaught and suffered huge losses. Stalin urgently needed help from the West. The British government pressed Sikorsky to reach a rapid agreement with Stalin. On July the 30th, 1941, the two signed a mutual support accord in Moscow. The British policy of appeasement under Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain had failed to prevent the German invasion of Poland. Winston Churchill, who took over as Prime Minister in May 1940, had seen through Hitler much earlier. Dictators can't be appeased, they must be resisted. Britain had declared war on Germany on account of Poland, but had remained inactive. What would the new Prime Minister do? From the moment the Soviet Union entered the war until uh, certainly Yalta, and in my view after Yalta, Britain pursued a policy of appeasement towards the Soviet Union. Uh, quite clearly, the Soviet Union wanted to keep uh, the borders as they had been on the eve of Barbarossa. Churchill and the British government knew that, and they knew that bringing that topic up with uh, Stalin would be a red rag to a bull. And we know what the British attitude is. Britain pursued a policy of appeasement towards Stalin and the Soviet Union, and quite clearly, uh, Poland was going to be the main victim of that policy of appeasement. 
Sikorsky traveled to Washington to ask President Roosevelt for help against Stalin. But Roosevelt merely held out the prospect of territorial reparations for Poland at Germany's cost. In August 1942, Churchill flew to Moscow for his first meeting with Stalin. To Stalin's fury, Churchill was unfortunate. Churchill was impressed, even fascinated, by some facets of the dictator and remained silent on the issue of Poland's future borders. The German discovery in the Katyn forest was presented to the world through a public exhumation. Nazi propaganda minister Josef Goebbels used Katyn for an attack on the Soviets. An international commission of 12 forensic pathologists examined the mass graves between the 28th and the 30th. It's likely that their report was also passed on to Sikorsky. The report revealed a shocking and tragic reality. Thousands of Polish officers, missing since 1939, had apparently been shot by the Soviet secret police, the NKVD, in the spring of 1940. Stalin, however, blamed the Germans for the atrocity. General Sikorsky could not, as the Prime Minister uh, of Poland and Commander-in-Chief of the Polish Armed Forces, be silent on, on the matter of, of the massacre, and he did say uh, and, and warn Churchill that he would, the Polish press would be issuing communiques as information was made available. And of course, this would be also a move which would upset the Russians. And this was the one thing which Churchill absolutely uh, didn't want to do, to, it was to, to, to upset uh, the alliance with the Soviet Union. Um, this was seen as crucial um, by Britain for winning the war, and also, it should be noted, by America. Katyn drove a wedge between Sikorsky and Churchill. Churchill's attitude became increasingly cool. He wanted to avoid being forced to choose between the two allies, Poland and the Soviet Union. It was for the sake of Polish freedom that Great Britain had declared war on Germany. But the situation had changed. On April the 15th, Sikorsky was summoned to Downing Street. Churchill tried in vain to placate the general, who, against Churchill's urgent advice, asked the International Red Cross to undertake a second examination of the mass graves. The Prime Minister was under enormous pressure. He needed Stalin in the war against Hitler. Katyn could not be allowed to further increase tensions with the Soviet Union. I think we come back here again to this policy of appeasement that Britain pursued towards Stalin. Essentially, anything that would upset Anglo-Soviet relations uh, was a no-no. Because, of course, one of the things that Churchill and the British government were terribly worried about was the prospect of Stalin making a negotiated separate peace with Hitler. Therefore, anything, anything at all that upset Stalin had to be avoided. Remember, you know, we're talking here about a, a year, a whole year, in which Britain had twice promised a second front in Europe and twice not delivered it. So, of course, they weren't going to risk upsetting Stalin over this vital issue. In fact, far from supporting Sikorsky, Churchill and Eden and the British Foreign Office are furious with the Poles uh, for agreeing to the Red Cross request. But Sikorsky wanted the truth. He could not pass over this monstrous crime against Poland. Stalin, however, would tolerate no further accusations. On April the 26th, 1943, the Soviet ambassador in London, Ivan Maisky, broke off diplomatic relations with Sikorsky's government. Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov wrote, the Soviet government knows that this campaign has been undertaken by the Polish government in order to apply pressure in support of the false Hitlerite defamer with the intent to secure territorial concessions. A perfidious stab in the back for the Soviet Union, 
which is making great sacrifices in the war against the Hitler tyranny. Following the discovery of the Katyn massacre by German troops, Goebbels intended to make propaganda capital out of it, to drive a wedge into the Western camp, and he nearly succeeded. The Soviet Union would have been compromised, and that wasn't in the interests of the Western powers either. That's why London and Washington played the matter down. And Stalin certainly couldn't allow the Soviet Union, the major power fighting Hitler, to be pilloried as a criminal nation that had shot 10,000 Polish officers. That was unthinkable. And actually, the Poles should have realized that. In telegrams, to Roosevelt among others, Stalin himself complained about Sikorsky, denouncing the Polish general and premier as a Nazi collaborator who needed to be brought under control. Roosevelt defended Sikorsky, but agreed with Stalin that Poland had made mistakes with regard to Katyn. On May the 6th, 1943, Stalin sent a strongly worded telegram to Churchill, calling for changes in the Polish government in exile. There are so many Hitler supporters in the Polish government, the telegram read, and Sikorsky is so helpless that it is uncertain he can be loyal to the Soviet Union, even if he wanted to be. In everything Stalin wrote in notes or actually said, there was always a grain of truth. Relations between Nazi Germany and Poland had been very good up to early 1939. There are pictures of Himmler in full uniform on Warsaw Main Station in 1939. Some secret talks about counterintelligence against Bolshevism. Between Berlin and Warsaw, in terms of anti-Bolshevism and anti-Semitism, the persecution of the Jews, there was a lot of common ground. Gibraltar, British territory and an important military base between East and West, where aircraft could refuel. At the end of May 1943, six weeks before his death, Sikorsky and his daughter Zofia set off for Egypt and Iraq to inspect Polish troops. Sikorsky had been strongly warned against flying to the Middle East. In fact, Churchill rang him at home twice, asking him not to take Zofia with him because it was too dangerous. Shortly after the converted Liberator bomber had left Gibraltar, the exiled government in London received an anonymous call saying Sikorsky's plane had crashed on takeoff and he'd been killed. When the plane arrived intact in Cairo hours later, the call was dismissed as a bad joke. In my opinion, it was a message to Sikorsky. We know why you're flying to the Middle East. If you don't change your plans, you'll die. It was a warning for Sikorsky. Sikorsky traveled to various cities in the Middle East, including Cairo and Baghdad. He visited Polish army camps, talked to his generals, and inspected the troops in Iraq, Jordan, and Palestine. History still can't really tell us why Sikorsky went to the Middle East. Was it just about inspecting the army or something else? 
z Ankary, właśnie od Franca von Papena, który był ambasadorem. We don't know much on the subject. Some people claim that in Beirut, Sikorski received documents on the Katyn massacre sent from Ankara by Franz von Papen, the German ambassador to Turkey. We know that the British tried to relieve Sikorski of his luggage and that he made a great fuss about it. He told them that they mustn't even touch his cases. He took them with him on the return journey. But they disappeared. We don't know what happened to them. Meanwhile, a courier with the name of Jan Gralewski was traveling on behalf of the Polish underground movement from Warsaw right across Europe to Spain. Who was this Jan Gralewski? Was he carrying secret documents with him? What was his mission? His role remains a mystery. By a tortuous route, he reached Gibraltar with a message for the leader of the Polish armed forces and government. Sikorski did not know him by sight, so the courier could have been intercepted on the way and replaced by a substitute. Cairo, July the 3rd, 1943. General Sikorski, his daughter Zofia and his escort reached the airport just before dawn. The aircraft to take them via Gibraltar to London stood ready, a British government plane. Panie generale, melduje liberatora gotowego do lotu. Dziękuję. For the return flight to Gibraltar, Sikorski chose a Czech pilot he knew well, Eduard Prchal. Sikorski had great faith in his exceptional flying skills. As a token of his confidence, he had given him a silver cigarette case engraved with a personal inscription. Boarding the aircraft in Cairo, apart from Sikorski, his daughter Zofia and his closest aides, were two British passengers in civilian clothes. British intelligence agents? The long flight over the Mediterranean passed off without incident. In the late afternoon, the rock of Gibraltar came into view. The Liberator landed at 18.37 hours on the short runway. It was not a civilian airport. It was completely under British military control. Governor of Gibraltar, Noel Mason McFarlane, welcomed Sikorsky and his daughter in person. The general, Zofia, and their aides were to be guests in the governor's residence for the next 24 hours. The governor immediately informed London of their arrival. <laughs> Mason McFarlane asked to speak to Sikorsky in private. The governor told Sikorsky that the Soviet ambassador, Ivan Maisky, was due to arrive from London early the next morning. To avoid a diplomatic incident, it would be better if Maisky didn't know that Sikorsky was in Gibraltar. Mason McFarlane asked if Sikorsky and his delegation would stay in their rooms the next morning until Maisky had left. The general understood the delicacy of the situation and agreed. 
których bowiem nie jest w stanie zrozumieć. It's hard to understand how the Soviet ambassador could appear in Gibraltar on the very day that Sikorski was there. Historians have overlooked this question. Co ciekawe, a historia o tym zapomniała. When Maisky set out from London, Sikorski was already in Gibraltar. So Maisky was deliberately sent by someone who wanted the two men to meet. In the evening, the governor invited Sikorski and Zofia to an official dinner. Also invited were Polish officers and soldiers stationed in Gibraltar. During the meal, the courier, Jan Gralewski, requested a one-to-one -one meeting with Sikorski. His aides were against it, but Sikorski agreed. The following day, July the 4th, 1943, the plane carrying the Soviet ambassador landed in Gibraltar at around 7 a.m. Ivan Maisky was also flying in a British government liberator. On board was at least one agent of the Soviet Secret Service, probably several. Maisky's plane parked right next to Sikorsky's liberator. Stalin was impatient because a second front had still not been launched in the West. For this reason, he'd recalled his ambassadors from London, Washington and Ottawa to Moscow. Was it in fact a coincidence that Maisky arrived in Gibraltar when Sikorsky was there? The governor would have had no difficulty in delaying Maisky's arrival by a day if he had really been concerned to avoid a diplomatic incident. Half an hour after the Soviet ambassador's plane landed, an unknown figure approached Sikorsky's aircraft and boarded it. At this point, Maisky was having breakfast with Mason McFarlane, while the Polish visitors remained in their rooms as agreed. On the day of the crash, Sikorsky's liberator was left for quite a while unguarded on the airfield, directly next to Maisky's plane. Did someone seize their opportunity? Udało mi się również ustalić, że Majski startuje do Kairu z Gibraltaru nie o nie w południe. I have discovered that Majski did not leave Gibraltar for Cairo in the morning, but at night, long after the catastrophe. So he was present in Gibraltar the whole time. Obecny na Gibraltarze. Whether he was just a witness to events, or whether he had a criminal hand in them himself. We don't know. But we do know that Maisky worked for Moscow's secret police chief, Beria. So he could have been given any job to carry out in Gibraltar, including murder. Jako taki mógł odegrać na Gibraltarze każdą rolę, nawet rolę mordercy. In the afternoon, General Sikorski took the salute at a parade of Polish troops stationed in Gibraltar. It was 1400 hours, nine hours before takeoff. An official car was waiting to take Zofia on a shopping trip. She was reluctant to leave her father alone, but he made her go.
It's assumed that by now the general was in possession of the German documents on the Katyn massacre. Names, ranks and ages were all listed. Sikorsky knew many of the murdered officers personally. If the lists had been published in London, he could have broken up the British-Soviet alliance. Ale do Sikorskiego zwrócili się Niemcy. I przekazali Sikorskiemu. The Germans had contacted Sikorski and given him the documents on the Katyn massacre. We can be almost 100% certain that Sikorski had flown back to Gibraltar from the Middle East with the Katyn papers. Eighteen hundred hours. Five hours to take off. Sikorski and his staff are getting ready for leaving. The documents would have been carefully packed among the luggage. On the airstrip, Liberator AL-523 was being refueled. The pilot inspected the plane. Everything appeared to be in order. Then, without going through passport control, the passengers arrived on the runway in small groups. The Polish courier, Jan Gralewski, and the two Britons who joined the plane in Cairo also boarded the aircraft. General Sikorski and his delegation were the last to arrive. Governor Mason McFarlane took leave of his guests in person on the runway. Finally, Sikorski and his staff boarded the plane. The pilot did not wear a life jacket on takeoff, a superstitious quirk of his. He started the engines. The doors and hatches were closed. He signaled, ready for takeoff. The Liberator taxied to the western end of the runway. All lights along the runway were switched off for takeoff. But for no apparent reason, the plane stayed where it was, in complete darkness. I found out years ago that the Liberator stopped at the end of the runway. The head of Polish military intelligence told me. The plane waited for 50 minutes on the runway. Then, something was unloaded from the plane and something else was taken on board. No one could see what, because it was in darkness. Fifty minutes or twenty minutes, accounts vary. Then finally the plane took off. and 16 seconds later crashed into the sea. The alarm was immediately raised. Rescue teams were called. Lifeboats were launched. Within minutes, two lifeboats reached the scene of the crash. General Sikorsky's body was retrieved. All the other passengers also died in the crash or were missing, like Sikorsky's daughter, Zofia. Just one man was brought to shore alive, the pilot, Edward Prahal. Apart from a broken ankle, he was unhurt. Oddly enough, when he was rescued, he was wearing a life jacket. Not donned in haste, but with all the belts and hooks carefully fastened. Rahal insisted, however, that he had not worn a life jacket. When questioned about the crash later, he said that the controls of the aircraft had jammed, completely disabling it. Salvaging the wreckage began the next morning. 
The Liberator lay in shallow water. Divers searched the seabed. Sikorsky's daughter Zofia and four other people were not found. All the other bodies were recovered, together with documents, mailbags, and personal effects. Numerous documents and whole bundles of pound notes were floating on the surface. The plane was almost intact on the seabed, but only individual parts were brought ashore. The pilot remained adamant that he had not worn a life jacket, but several members of the rescue team testified that Prahal had been rescued wearing an inflated life jacket. Why did he maintain the opposite with such vehemence? Wszyscy piloci all pilots flying for the British government air wing were intelligence officers. Prachal, too, belonged to the Secret Service and had orders to carry out. Rumors immediately spread throughout Europe that Sikorsky had been murdered. The first news of his death was broadcast by German radio from Berlin. Apparently, the German consulate near Gibraltar had received detailed information about the night's events. The Germans suspected Churchill of having something to do with the crash. Others saw indications that pointed to Stalin or to the Polish opposition. In the days that followed, Churchill ordered an inquiry into the crash. The commission appointed found no explanation for the jamming of the controls and no pilot error. The Poles didn't recognize the report since they had been excluded from the commission of inquiry. If there was nothing to hide, then why not allow a full Polish investigative commission to take part alongside the British uh, invest investigation? An observer was allowed, a Polish observer was allowed to attend but uh, without um, any of the full rights of a full member of the committee. The inquiry concluded that the crash had been an accident and that sabotage could be ruled out. We know there was speculation at the time uh, that this was sabotage, and we know there was speculation at the time as to who caused the sabotage. Quite clearly, this is an inspired attempt coming from the British government via the Times to try to put a, a, a cap on that and to say, no, there's no sabotage at all, it's just an accident. But the final report of the inquiry did state that an unknown person had boarded the plane. The report also registered that a mailbag had been found on the runway the following morning. Many questions remained unanswered. Who was the man eyewitnesses claimed to have seen swimming ashore shortly after the crash? Why were large numbers of pound notes found floating in the sea after the crash? Why was the pilot wearing a life jacket and why did he claim he wasn't? Why is there no mention in the report of Ivan Maisky's visit to Gibraltar? And why were Sikorsky's 66 bone fractures not mentioned in the report? Was the outcome of the inquiry a foregone conclusion? Evidence was covered up, false trails were laid, and not all the witnesses were heard. What was Churchill's role in all this? The rumors surrounding Sikorsky's death did not abate after the Second World War. In 1969, the British government felt obliged to reopen the Sikorsky case. Various publications had raised the question of Churchill's involvement in a possible assassination. The new inquiry found that the Liberator had not been guarded all the time, and that deliberate tampering with the plane could no longer be ruled out. It's interesting to note that in the 1969 uh, commission, um, set up by uh, the Labour Party, uh, the Labour government at the time. Um, this was one of the aspects which was um, 
much criticized. I said that was the first commission was far too quick to jump to the conclusion and to state such so categorically that uh, sabotage could be ruled out. So the second uh, commission of inquiry leaves the question more open. If the plane had really crashed, there would just have been a heap of wreckage. Nothing would have been left intact. The whole crash theory is false. There was no accident. The plane put down slowly and carefully into the sea. It floated for six or eight minutes on the surface before it sank. That's the truth. The pilot, Prachal, was carrying out orders. What actually happened during the time the plane waited at the end of the runway? 20 minutes would have been enough time for secret agents to enter and leave the plane. After putting the occupants out of action, so that they couldn't save themselves when it was sinking. Was it the Soviet secret service infiltrated by Ivan Maisky? Or was it a mission conducted by British intelligence alone? The only one who would have to have survived a fate crash would have been the pilot. Prahal was certainly experienced enough to carry out a careful ditching of his aircraft, and he was susceptible to blackmail. Prahal smuggled alcohol from the Middle East to England, for which he stood to lose his flying license and face a prison sentence. Was Prahal forced into this risky maneuver? And what was Ivan Maisky's role? In his memoirs, he later falsified the date and claimed not to have been in Gibraltar on the day of the crash. Maisky, the Soviet ambassador, did not write the truth in his book. He lied. He lied about everything concerning the catastrophe. He claimed he only arrived in Gibraltar on July the 5th, after Sikorsky's death. So, he couldn't have known anything about it. Was it pure coincidence that Maisky and Sikorsky were in Gibraltar at the same time? It's strange that in his memoirs, Churchill wrote not one word about Sikorsky's violent death. Sikorsky's coffin was taken to London to the headquarters of the Polish government in exile. He was buried in a Polish military cemetery near Nottingham. It was only in 1993 that a freely elected Polish government was able to transfer his remains to Krakow. Churchill addressed the Poles on the radio. Soldiers have to die, he said, but by their death they nourish the nation which gave them birth. Many things were now a lot easier for Churchill. Sikorsky's death gave Churchill an opportunity that he hadn't had while Sikorsky was alive. Sikorsky, of course, was a man of great stature. He was a visible reminder of the part the Poles had played and were pay, pay, playing in the war. He was a very public figure. He was a figure who commanded a great deal of prestige and respect. And his removal actually made it very much easier uh, for Churchill and the British government to try to pressurize his successors, who of course were much less famous, had much less prestige, were much less well known. It made it much easier in the end for Churchill to do what he does in 1944 and 45, uh, which is effectively uh, to hand Poland over into the Soviet bloc. Relations between Stalin and the Western powers benefited. 1944 was all harmony because troublemaker Poland was out of the way. 
And the successor government under Mikowajczyk was much too weak to play any sort of international role. Stalin could now aim for a communist state in Poland, and that's what he vigorously pressed ahead with. Sikorsky's successor, Mikowajczyk, had no chance of asserting himself among the big three. In October 1944, in Moscow, it was not Stalin but Churchill who forced him to relinquish the eastern half of Poland. Churchill's travels took him everywhere, but not to Poland. In his memoirs, he wrote that he had put Mikowajczyk under the strongest pressure. And Mikowajczyk noted in his diary, Churchill pointed his finger at me and shouted, if you Poles do not accept the border, the Russians will sweep into your country and your people will be liquidated. To this day, the precise circumstances of Sikorsky's death remain a mystery. There is no evidence of murder, but there is much to suggest that Stalin ordered his elimination and that Churchill covered up the crime.